we're going to talk about um, the role that the pharmaceutical industry is currently playing in American healthcare. Now, <clears throat> the pharmaceutical industry, the drug company expenditures, drug, pharmaceutical expenditures, account for only 17% of our total healthcare spending. So the pharmaceutical industry will say, how can we be blamed for the dysfunction in American healthcare when we account for less than a fifth of uh, medical spending? And that's really what I want to explain today, um, how that happens, how the tail wags the dog, the tail of the pharmaceutical industry wags the dog of American healthcare. And the short answer is by controlling what uh, doctors, even the best doctors, believe is the knowledge that should inform their patient care. And uh, with that, I, I want to start. So here's a, a cartoon or half a cartoon actually from the uh, New Yorker, which is just masterful at capturing uh, our current situations. And here's a philosopher um, you can see with a quizzical open look, and he's starting his journey towards the truth. And he's prepared to see, learn what's there. <clears throat> now I want to kind of jump ahead in this presentation and give you an example of what that philosopher, philosopher will find when he gets to the truth. So I had a political science professor uh, who used to say where they stand depends on where they sit. And in this case, I'm gonna tell you what Pfizer and BioNTech and, and Moderna have to say about getting a booster. And then we'll go over and we'll hear what somebody from the World Health Organization has to say. So Pfizer and BioNTech say the potency of their initial booster wanes within three to six months against both symptomatic infection and severe disease. Data from Israel suggests the second booster restores protection. Now, remember, they make money when they sell boosters. And I want to make it clear from the very beginning, I am, I am a very strong pro-vaxxer, pro-getting the initial series and pro-getting a, a single booster after the initial series. Um, what happens with that four, uh, second booster is a little bit in question now. And th that's the point I'm gonna make here. So Pfizer and BioNTech says, say their booster wanes and you need another, you need a second booster to restore pr protection. And Moderna's chief medical officer says the only way that we're gonna get a period of stability and ultimately to an endemic disease is to keep people protected, keep their antibody levels up, and I'm afraid that means regular boosting. I, I don't think he's that afraid it means regular boosting, but that's what he said. Now let's see what a woman from the, Dr. Kate O'Brien from the Director of Vaccines Department at the World Health Organization says, and I ask you to listen to these words carefully because I think she meant what exactly what she said. We're in a relatively weak position on the sort of policy front around exactly what the data are that are compelling decisions about fourth doses. She's giving you a very different message than the Pfizer-BioNTech people are and then that the Moderna people are. Now in the United States, it's the drug companies that get the major share of voice for doctors and for patients. So now we see our philosopher went out looking for the truth and he saw the truth and he's coming back and he doesn't look so happy. And that's really what my lecture is gonna be about. It's about what's wrong. A lot of the other lectures, most of the other lectures are speaking about how to improve your health. And I'm gonna be speaking about how to defend yourself against a commercially biased healthcare system. And a commercially biased healthcare system that the doctors do not understand. So let's just frame American healthcare first <clears throat> in broad brushstrokes. Here is, um, let me get rid of this. This is a graph of overall age, oops. of overall age-adjusted mortality 
um, age-adjusted mortality is a way to be able to compare the mortality rates in different countries because different countries have different median ages, age distributions. And of course, countries that have older people living there are going to have higher death rates. So age-adjusted mortality corrects for the differences in age and allows a fair comp comparison between countries. So here we see a graph where the United States is in green, is green, and compared to 10 other comparable countries. And we go back to 1980, and we see that the adjusted mortality rate in the United States was lower than the mortality rate in the 10 comparable countries. <clears throat> and, um, gee. and although this looks like a very small amount of difference, it meant that 100,000 fewer Americans were dying every year because our mortality rate was lower than the mortality rate in the 10 comparable countries. But if we come out to 2017 is the latest data we have for this uh, computed, <clears throat> we see that the United States mortality rate is now considerably higher than the mortality rate in the other countries. And it translates into 485,000 Americans dying every year in excess of uh, projections based on the death rate in the other countries. 480, 85,000 people. That translates into over 1,300 people a day dying because American health and healthcare have become so inferior to the other wealthy countries. 1,300 people a day dying. That's exactly the same as the COVID uh, pandemic, the, the same number of lives that the COVID pandemic has taken over the first two years. But these data are from before the pandemic. So 1,300 American deaths every day, like, like three jumbo jets crashing every single day. Imagine how that would dominate the news if something was wrong with our airplane industry and there were three jumbo jet, jumbo jet crashes every day with no survivors. And yet the difference between American death rates and the death rates in the other wealthy countries is not heard, no news, nothing, we don't know anything about it. So um, sometimes data about deaths in adults doesn't really get to us. It doesn't have emotional impact, but data about deaths in kids does. So let's look at how this affects kids. This is uh, uh, Americans under the age of uh, uh, 19 and under. So in 1961, in, during the, six, during the um, 60s, the death rate for American kids was so much lower than the OECD rate that 32,500 fewer American kids died in that decade. And that's a really good thing. It shows that we were really ahead of the other countries in terms of pediatric deaths. But if we look at the, 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 the decades that ensued, we see that this changes radically. And that instead of having 32,500 fewer deaths, <clears throat> we start having 95,000 more deaths and 163,000 more deaths uh, in each decade, 189, and then 207. So what we are seeing is that between 1971 and 2010, 655,000 kids died in the United States because our pediatric death rate is so much higher than the other countries. 655,000 pediatric deaths. It, it's just, it's, put that in terms of what we're seeing in the tragedy in Ukraine. It's just astonishing how big these differences are. And um, for the young kids, infant mortality, our higher rate of infant mortality is the primary cause of death. And for the older kids between 15 and 19, it's gun violence and traffic accidents. 
So the Annals of Internal Medicine is the uh, board for internists has been trying to be proactive and taking a stand about reducing firearm violence. Uh, and they wrote this essay uh, in 2018, taking this, again, repeating that they're taking a stand and that this is a major health issue. After this edit, editorial was published, the NRA got into the act and they sent this tweet. Someone should tell self-important anti-gun doctors to stay in their lane. Half of the articles in Annals of Internal Medicine are pushing for gun control. This is the NRA writing a tweet. Most upsetting, however, the medical community seems to have consulted no one but themselves. I'm not sure where you would find epidemiologists who would be addressing this outside of the medical community, but nonetheless, that's the NRA's position. A woman named Judy Melanick, a forensic pathologist, responded, <clears throat> excuse me, to this, to the NRA's tweet. And this is what they had to say. This is what Judy Melanick had to say, forensic pathologist. She said, do you have any idea <clears throat> how many bullets I pull out of corpses weekly? This isn't just my lane. This is my effing highway. And this is the point that I want to make. This is the point of the whole lecture, is that as a country, we're failing to uh, provide adequate health care and health to American citizens. It's a colossal failure, and we don't talk about it. And the main reason that we don't talk about it is that it doesn't serve the vested interests who are making a ton of money while this is going on. And those vested interests, particularly the pharmaceutical industry, have one primary job. It's not to make us healthier. It's not to improve the overall health of the American people, though sometimes they do that. Sometimes they help. But their job is to maximize the financial returns that they deliver to their investors. That's their job. And they do it very well. And I'm going to show you how well they do it. <clears throat> so we were just looking at kids. Now we're going to go back to the whole population. And the best way to, the best single snapshot of the health, of the comparative health of countries is how many years of healthy life expectancy is there in each country? So healthy life expectancy means how many years the average citizen will live in good health. And if they have a chronic disease, if people have a chronic disease, say they have chronic renal failure, and it started at age 80 and went to age 86 when they died, and the um, chronic renal failure decreased their quality of life by 50%, then their healthy life expectancy would be 83 years. They'd get half of those years between 80 and 86 because of the decrement in the quality of life. So this is a healthy life expectancy. In 2000, the United States ranked 38th in the world in healthy life expectancy. And uh, between 2000 and 2019, before the pandemic, we fell to 68th in the world. And you can see in 2010, our healthy life expectancy was 66.7 years, then it went down a little in 2015, and it went down even more than in uh, 2019. Now, there are only three countries in the world in which healthy life expectancy decreased as much as in the United States, Syria, Yemen, and Venezuela. This is not very good company to be in. It's just shocking what's going on. And <clears throat> we hear these statistics and we think, well, oh, that's too bad. It's the poor people, it's the racial minorities, it's the whatever, but it's not us because we um, are not discriminated against and we, most of us went to college, some didn't, but most of us went to college and earn a good living and we uh, have healthy behaviors that does not protect us from this phenomenon. 
This is an article from JAMA uh, in um, 2013. And it says the U.S. health disadvantage is more pronounced among vulnerable populations, but it can also be found among more privileged groups. Even non-Hispanic white adults or those with health insurance, a college education, high incomes, or healthy behaviors are to appear, appear to be in worse health, meaning higher infant mortality, higher rates of chronic diseases, and lower life expectancy in the United States than they are in other high income countries. So that means this affects us all. This is not somebody else. This is not somebody else's problem. This does not mean because we have insurance and we have enough money to purchase whatever healthcare we need or want. It doesn't buy our way out of the American, uh, Americans' poor health and healthcare. So for this poor healthcare, we are spending a fortune. <clears throat> this is a graph of health consumption expenditures as a percentage of GDP. GDP is the best way to, percentage of GDP spent on health is the best way to compare um, the medical expenditures in different countries. If we just look at how much we spend, the difference in American spending is even greater than the other countries, but it's not fair with higher GDP for, it's not fair to hire GDP countries because it just costs more to provide the healthcare. It costs more to pay the truck drivers to, to deliver the uh, medical, medical goods, and it costs more to hire nurses. So the fairest way to compare spending between countries is the percentage of GDP. Uh, and we see back in 1970, that uh, there was a small difference. Uh, this is about a 2% difference between American spending as a percentage of GDP and the other comparable countries. And we see how much this has grown uh, through this data goes through 2019. And we see how the spread has more than tripled so that we're now spending about 7% more of our GDP than comparable countries. 7% of our GDP translates into an excess, excess spending of $1.5 trillion a year. $1.5 trillion a year. That's like uh, the cost of President Biden's Build Back Better bill, $1.5 trillion over 10 years, and we're spending, wasting $1.5 trillion each year, and we're having an additional 485,000 Americans die. So we're spending so much more money and getting so much worse health. <clears throat> I'll be interested when we get to the questions and, <clears throat> excuse me, questions and comments, how much of this is new information for folks? Uh, how much of this you already knew about? So here's a uh, a uh, graph that looks at the healthcare system performance compared to spending. <clears throat> and on this side, we have health uh, system performance, and that's based on um, uh, administrative uh, efficiency and access to care, equity, healthcare outcomes. We have higher health system performance and lower health system performance. And here we have spending as healthcare spending as a percentage of GDP as I was describing uh, just a minute ago. And we see that 10 country average, um, those countries uh, group really close to each other. Um, there's no outlier there, but if you look very closely, you'll see that the United States isn't in that graph, it is in this one. And the United States is all the way down here in the worst quadrant of the graph with by far the lowest healthcare performance and by far the highest percentage of GDP that we're spending on healthcare.